morning and welcome to the launch of this year's Minimum Standards in the UK report. Wonderful to have so many of you joining us here today. My name is Adele Schofield and I have the pleasure of chairing the discussion today. I have managed the Minimum Income Standards or MIS programme of work at the Joseph Roundtree Foundation since 2019. It has been going a lot longer than that, of course. MIS shows us what the public think households need for an acceptable minimum standard of living and has become an important reference point in analysis of public policy and in applied social practice. Over the course of the next hour, the research team will present the latest on MIS and COVID, and we will hear from three speakers about how MIS is being applied by charities, in the legal world, and in local government. These practical examples will show the potential of MIS to be used in a range of ways in the future to support decent living standards in the post-COVID era. We will have about 15 minutes at the end for the panel to answer some questions live. Please do use the Q&A function to ask those questions as we go along. We're also recording this and we'll share the recording after the event. So let's get started. First, we will hear from Peter Matchik, Deputy Director of Evidence and Impact at JRF. He leads the team providing the knowledge base to underpin and assess JRF's outcome plans and real world impact. Before joining JRF, Peter worked for almost 20 years in the civil service where he led on several issues involving poverty analysis and the government's annual poverty statistics. Peter, over to you. Thanks Adele and thanks everybody for joining this session. So I'm delighted to be speaking at the launch on behalf of JRF. We've been funding MIRS or the Minimum Income Standards since 2006 with the first report uh, launched in 2008. And I was actually there in 2008 for that first launch. And 13 years later, I'm really proud to be able to be launching it on behalf of, of JRF this time round. Since its start, it's clear that MIS has improved public understanding by encouraging discussion about what people need in order to live at a socially acceptable minimum. It's calculated using an in-depth democratic and non-arbitrary method. I'm sure Abby's going to talk you through exactly how that method's, how that method's done. But it's this method that's one of the unique features of MIS across all of the measures of living standards that are, that are out there. Uh, the approach is to draw up a minimum income standard in, uh, to agree the items of a basket through consensus, through discussions between members of the public. And this has involved over 150 focus groups, I, I believe, over the, over the period, which is a lot of focus groups and other people in rooms. Uh, at JRF, we've used the insights from MIS to look at what people need for a decent living standard and what are the key costs uh, contributing to that. So certain elements of the baskets like costs of childcare, um, costs of different elements. Um, so that's, that's, um, those are kind of critical as well. Um, it also acts as a check on the validity of poverty lines. And we also monitor the number of families falling below the minimum income standard each year. And look out for a report on this later in the year. I'd also like to flag the great qualitative research uh, that the team has done earlier this year, looking at families below a low income. Um, and there were two great reports of that out, I think, in March time. And these are following the longitudinal follow up studies. There's, a, I think, there's about 14 families and really in depth qualitative research there. Really do look at that. Um, so in terms of specifics and how JRF used that, um, unfortunately this report demonstrates the inadequacy of the benefit system. You'll have seen some coverage in the news this morning about that. And with the lo looming cut to universal credit, this reduces the value of out-of-work benefits to the lowest recorded level relative to what the public thinks um, the, you know, the minimum acceptable standard should be. If implemented, the, this cut would reduce the value of the support to 55% of MIS for a couple with two children aged three and seven, and just 33% of MIS for a single working age person without children. Working families on low incomes will also see the support fall sharply. On the on more positive side, and the report does show that some working parents have in recent years been able to get closer to MIS due to increases in the national living wage plus this £20 a week increase in universal credit and more support for childcare under universal credit compared to the previous system. Um, but and, you know, as I said previously, the resulting improvements in incomes risk to be risk being reversed if the cut for, to the £20 a week goes ahead. Over the years, many other organisations have come to rely on this as a basis for their work on improving the lives of people on low incomes. And I'm looking forward to hearing about a range of these today. Certainly its use in the living wage campaign has improved the wages of many thousands of workers, something not many analytical products can lay claim to. 
Related to this, do look out for the launch of our Make Jobs Work campaign shortly, which shows how a good job can provide a way out of poverty and a foundation for building a better life. But this requires jobs where people are treated with dignity and respect, where they can work around caring responsibilities and health needs, and where they're provided the security and stability needed to plan family lives and finances, as well as a decent wage, as, um, as Ms would, would, would recommend. Additionally, the minimum income calculator published alongside the report allowed anybody, including everybody on this meeting, to check their income against MIRS and adjust the calculations according to their own circumstances. We hope the tool enhances the reach of MIRS and we intend to work with colleagues at the University of Loughborough and users to further extend its reach and impact. This event should whet your appetite on further uses for MIRS and we'd like to support you if you do want to explore this for yourself. Um, so enjoy the rest of the event and it's a pleasure to, to be launching it. Thank you very much, Peter. We will hear next from Abigail Davis, who is a Senior Research Fellow and Associate Director at the Centre for Research in Social Policy at Loughborough University. Abigail has been part of the MIST team since the programme began in 2006 and is responsible for the core primary research on this. She leads the development and delivery of training in the MIS methodology for international teams, including MIS projects in Austria, France, Ireland, Japan, Portugal, South Africa, Mexico, Singapore, and Thailand. Before we hear from Abigail, we have a short explainer video about MIS. The minimum income standard, or MIS for short, is a way of answering the question, how much is enough? What do you need to live in dignity? We bring together members of the public from different backgrounds to discuss what's needed, not just to survive, but to be able to take part in society and not feel excluded. We ask pensioners to talk about the needs of pensioners, working age people to tell us what working age people need, and parents to discuss the needs of parents and children. From socks to spoons, broadband to bath towels, Groups tell us what is needed and help us to understand why those things are important. These things vary across household types, but include being able to exercise and spend time with others. Parents groups include swimming lessons for children to give them healthy exercise and an important life skill. Older people need to be able to send birthday cards to friends and family, so some money for postage is included. Working age people need transport to allow them to access employment opportunities. Once we have an agreed list, we price everything up and work out the income required in order to meet the standard. Why is MIS useful? MIS gives us a way of understanding our society. Doing new research every two years means we capture changes over time. It helps us to track how different parts of our society are doing how many households are able to meet the standard and who's at risk of falling below it. It has a huge impact on the lives of lots of working people. Since 2011, MIS has informed the setting of the real living wage, which is now paid by more than 7,000 employers in the UK and recognises that people need to be able to earn enough to have a decent quality of life. Some charities use MIS to decide who most needs their support and how much help to give them. It's been cited in legal cases and helped to show that employment tribunal fees were unfair. Since that decision, thousands more people have had access to justice. MIS has also been adopted around the world as a way of looking at living standards in other countries. MIS tells us what people need in order to live in dignity. And, and that's, that's important, important for, for all of us. us. So good morning, everyone. Um, I would say it's lovely to see you all here, but I can't see you. Um, and it's a little bit sad that we can't have this in person because those events are always fantastic and it would be brilliant to see everybody together. But it's also brilliant that we can do this online and bring together lots of people who might not otherwise have been able to attend. And uh, really, I'd love to express our thanks to uh, JRF and particularly to the team that we work closest with, to Adele and Peter and Malou and Eleanor for helping make this event such a great thing. Um, and also I have to thank our team at CRISP because Ms is a huge endeavour and very much a team effort. And without 
everyone in CRISP, we wouldn't be able to do this. So I've got the uh, job of telling you in about seven minutes, everything that's in the report. I can't do that, um, but I will show you some kind of edited highlights and there's lots more information in the report, obviously. So I will share my screen with you, hopefully the right one. There we go. So this year's report, the 2021 um, iteration of MIS, um, what have we found? In very brief, um, as Peter referred to, uh, looking at the needs of a single working age adult, in order to reach MIS, they need 213 pounds a week. However, if they are on out of work benefits, they're only getting 89 pounds a week. So well under half of what they need. If they manage to work half time on the national living wage, they're getting closer, but you can see there's still a fair gap. Um, not a fair gap, that's a terrible expression. There's a big gap. Um, and then if they manage to work full time, then the gap is smaller, but still um, appreciably short of what you would need in order to have this minimum acceptable standard that members of the public agree on. And if you look at what happens when the 20 pounds is taken away, it's clear that that gap is only gonna get bigger. As I said, a whistle stop tour. And I should mention that as uh, Peter referred to, single working age people on benefits are now only getting 33% of what they need to reach MIS, which is the lowest um, recorded figure we've seen since 2008 because of rising inflation among other things. So for families with children, if they are out of work, they are looking at around 60% of MIS. If the 20 pounds comes off, it will look at just over half of what they need. A couple with two children, if they're both working full-time on national living wage, can just about get to MIS, but many people aren't able to do this. Some of the, uh, well, lots of research, but also particularly the stuff that um, Peter was referring to, uh, the families living below MIS, um, there are lots of reasons why that isn't a reality for many couples, uh, which can be to do with the, the fact that the employment just isn't there, they can't work more hours because they're not available or the, the kind of work they're doing doesn't enable them to work full time, or they may have other caring responsibilities or uh, health issues or disabilities within the household that make that impossible for them. And if you're a lone parent, obviously you've got one income rather than the potential for two, um, and they can't, even if they work full time on national living wage, they can't reach MIS. Um, and as we see inflation beginning to rise again, um, the prospects are concerning to say the least. So we also did, I said it was brief, um, some work on uh, how people thought about MIS in relation to the pandemic. Um, so after a year, really, after it was declared a pandemic in March 2020, we did nine groups across the UK um, to look at what, if any, effects there were on what people felt was needed for this standard of living, given what we've been going through for the past year. Um, and we asked them what they missed most and what changes um, the whole kind of COVID time had made. And looking ahead how they felt some of those changes might continue or would, would affect aspects of life. Um, and in a nutshell, what we found was things that had changed was how people access goods and services. There'd been a sh big shift online and people said they felt that to an extent that had been inevitable as you know, online um, becomes more and more a thing that's part of everyday life for many people but that this had sort of exacerbated or, or um, made that happen more, more quickly. Um, but for all of these things, there's a kind of counter where people also valued more their local community and were very appreciative of the fact that local goods and services um, would disappear if they weren't supported. So people were keen to um, perhaps support local businesses rather than national chains or whatever where they could. Um, Social participation was something that people had really missed, the spontaneity of being able to go and see somebody without having to worry about how many people were in the household or whether anyone was self-isolating or how many bubbles might be meeting or whatever it was. 
Um, and so not being able to do that, not being able to go away or um, have those sort of recreational opportunities that people thought were part of a minimum standard. Um, and interestingly, just because people have been without them, without being able to go get on a train and go and visit relatives in another part of the country or take their children away on holiday in the UK or anywhere else for that matter, didn't mean that they thought it was no longer necessary. Living without it had, if anything, magnified the importance of that and made it more apparent. Um, and they were absolutely adamant that what had been included in the budgets in pre-COVID time should remain there to enable people to, to be able to have those opportunities um, and options once um, the restrictions were lifted. It's changed employment for a lot of people and a lot of different needs. Um, some people are able to work from home and had appreciated the differences in terms of savings, not having to commute, uh, both in time and paying for uh, public transport or for fuel for cars and things. But that, as we know from ONS figures, is a minority of, of people. Not everybody can work from home. Those people in key worker roles um, in, and particularly public facing roles in retail, hospitality, um, health, all of those things would have either found their circumstances potentially significantly reduced through furloughing or seen their industry basically kind of fold up and disappear um, or um, they would have had to just keep going and still paying out for public transport even though it was harder to get buses because a bus is now full when it's at half capacity so perhaps you might have to wait for several buses before you could even get to work and you're still paying the fares so it's by no means a, the same picture for everyone people self who are self-employed um, some of them have been able to pivot to use the current kind of terminology and shift their business so they weren't paying the overheads for commercial premises and had been able to offer their community something um, and had been supported in that other people as I said their business just folded up and, and vanished and they had no way of knowing whether they would be able to re-establish it um, so employment is a very much a, a changing picture as we go forward and looking ahead as I said people were very keen to hang on to the bits of social participation that had been there in the past and they felt were still needed and also that the nature of work for many people is likely to change um, and it had really kind of highlighted the importance of stability and security so we had people talking about they had been looking to uh, change jobs or go for other opportunities but had had not done that because it was better to stay stable and in a stable job than try and reach beyond that or change track and um, for some people that even meant taking a pay cut in order to have the stability of a paid job rather than continue as an independent or as a consultant or working in the way that they had worked previously so it's a very much a shifting picture um, and I think what I'd like to highlight is particularly that those things that I've stressed about social participation, it's worth bearing in mind, especially if the £20 um, is taken away, that those are the things that are the first to for people to have to go without when they're making difficult choices about not having enough money to go around. So some people have been going out without holidays or being able to allow their kids to do activities or visit friends and relatives or go out and socialize for a long long time pre-covid and will continue to be in that situation if not worse um, as we go forward as constraints lift for other people those financial constraints are still very real part of those people's lives um, it's a changing picture we know um, and so that's one of the things all i can say is watch this space because next year around this time will be the 2022 launch with new in-depth qualitative um, research with groups of members of the public about the minimum income standard um, and that will tell us more about how these changes have um, taken place and what has changed what stayed the same and I will hand back to Adele. Thank you Abigail. Next I'd like to introduce Patrick Butler. Patrick is a social policy editor of The Guardian where he's worked for over 20 years. He reports on UK poverty and an inequality, social security, social care, local government and the voluntary sector. Prior to that, he edited the Guardian Society pages. Patrick, over to you. 
You're on mute, Patrick. Uh, hello, sorry about that. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, I'd like to talk about the minimum income standard from a journalistic perspective. Um, and I should say at the outset that I've always been a big fan of the minimum income standard. Um, it, it, it's, it's very, it's sort of very grave and serious research, but in many ways, it's actually fun, kind of geeky fun, really. And it's fascinating social history. It's a kind of um, a, 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 a kind of a window into the way we live now, really. And I find it really compelling. Um, I think it also tells the story of public policy and the consequences of public policies in many ways, how individuals adapt to change and, and what the cost of that change is. And what I particularly like about the MIS is the forensic detail um, that this involves when you go through the reports uh, in detail. I think it also tells us um, quite big truths about the UK in 2021 and I think it forces us to think about uh, the policies uh, that we need to um, need to adopt in the future to tackle some of these issues. Now, someone once said that it's not that we are in a bubble that is the problem. It's not realizing we're in a bubble when we address uh, the issues of the day. And I think the MIS research, the MIS research is a great way of us all, particularly politicians in the media of getting us to look out of our bubble. And I'll give a couple of examples. Um, uh, one of the great sort of zombie criticisms of some of the articles that I write for The Guardian. You can often see this if they switch the comments sections on, is when I write to people because they have a huge TV. And in other words, they're either not really poor or they, they're spending the kids' dinner money on expensive electrical goods. And, and that's the kind of view. But this gets you to think, well, is tea really a luxury or is it essential in any reasonable, socially acceptable, dignified life? And uh, this is where Ms. tells us that TV, well, ever since it started, has been pretty much regarded by everyone as an essential part of life. 2008, the basic TV that you could have uh, was a 26 inch digital with a free view box. And that had gone up to 32 inches um, by 2014. And by then, um, I think by uh, then they were also allowing a, a second smaller TV in the house for kids so that they could entertain friends on sleepovers. Um, internet access, that's also changed. I mean, 2008, I mean, it seems only yesterday, really, but the Miz said, uh, agreed, or the, the Miz panels agreed that if adults needed to go online, you just have to go to the local library if you were living a basic life. And it seems astonishing now. By 2014, this has changed. The internet was essential for everyone, even pensioners who previously thought it was a nice to have thing, this internet in the house. Um, and by 2018, obviously the world has changed. And by 2021, obviously, it seems to me that uh, the, if there's anything the pandemic has taught us, it's that the internet is essential for everyone, absolutely essential to have internet access in the home. Mobile phones as well is also a, a kind of astonishing tale of, of uh, sort of social evolution. It's difficult to believe, but in 2008, landlines, landlines were the norm uh, when people considered what a basic no frills, socially acceptable standard of living was. And you could have a mobile at a pinch, but quote, only for emergencies and only a pay as you go as that. Um, by 2014, parents and secondary age kids could have a contract phone. By 2018, smartphones were the absolute norm, which um, uh, for me is absolutely fascinating as a chronicle of the way, the way we live now. But 
I think what's also for me interesting when you look back at the years of the Miz is how it's also a chronicle of public policy in many ways, or at least the consequences of public policy. Um, so in a way it tells, it helps tell the story of austerity and declining public services, um, the private privatization of public space, the growth of private responsibility for various aspects of our life, uh, as well as the impact of social of reforms to um, social security. Um, so it was really fascinating to me that, um, you know, by 2018, um, it was not unconnected to the closure of libraries, um, that um, panelists were uh, saying that online in the home was, um, was, necess was necessary and that online access was, quote, a private rather than a public activity. Um, same to of transport, 2008, only back in 2008, the general consensus was if you were living a basic dignified life, you could get everywhere on public transport. Four years later, that had changed. Uh, buses and trains were, for the most part, you know, sufficiently available. But if you were a household with children, then you could have, uh, you were allowed in your basic life to buy a second hand car. And uh, I, I remember noting uh, with amusement that they specified probably a Ford Focus for smaller families, which I thought was, was very amusing. Um, by 2018, transport for households without kids was still the norm, but interestingly, because of job centre requirements that say, you know, if you're searching for work, you have to look for work up to 90 minutes travel away from where you live means that the requirements, the, the MIS requirements, people uh, uh, thought ought to be made more generous. So you still have to travel by public transport, but that allowance was more general to allow, uh, more generous to allow you to travel further. Um, so for me, the question of MIS becomes well, if policy has and recently has effectively transferred many costs to private households, whether that's the requirement to make a benefit claim online or the erosion of public transport, how is policy helping those households maintain their living standards? And my view is that what the MIS tells us is it's doing very little. In fact, while the basic content, the basic content of a socially acceptable, dignified existence hasn't really changed that much in 12 years. Um, what seems to me has changed is the possibility that people on low incomes uh, can actually afford, whether they're in work or out of work, are able to afford that minimum um, uh, income standard. So we learnt uh, this morning that a single parent in full-time work on national minimum wage falls 46 pounds short of minimum income standards each week. And if and when the 20 pound uplift to universal credit is taken away, that will be 66 pounds a week for that single parent, short of a decent dignified standard of living. Um, so where I would finish is to say that, you know, um, this is the bigger picture uh, revealed by Ms. And if a government is, serious uh, about uh, leveling up and raising living standards, um, uh, then it has to seriously look, about, look at the consequences of its policies and what policies it will need to choose in future. Um, and uh, I, I think in conclusion, I would say uh, the biggest the big picture for me really is one of policy disconnection and the MIS helps to in a way illustrate that disconnection between what most most people think is absolutely necessary for that decent basic dignified life and how in practice that standard is unachievable for millions of people and I think I would say that that is one of the great uh, policy challenges of today, uh, how to solve that. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Patrick. We'll now hear from Matt Padley. Matt is one of the lead researchers on the MIS for the UK programme of research. He also leads research on MIS in London and has pioneered work on retirement living standards. Matt leads the MIS Global Network founded in 2018 to support MIS work across the globe. In addition to MIS, his policy analysis and research has included work on housing affordability, place, poverty measurement, and international conceptions of living standards. Over to you, Matt. Uh, that makes me sound very grand, I think. Um, but thank you for that introduction, Adele. Um, uh, I'm talking briefly before we kind of hand over to um, three people who are going to talk about the, some of the ways in which um, MIS is being and has been used uh, kind of in practice. Um, as we've heard so far this morning, uh, since 2008, MIS has encouraged and informed discussion and debate around what's needed uh, for a minimum socially acceptable standard of living. Um, or to put it another way, it kind of sets out what's needed to live with dignity in contemporary society. Um, and kind of feeds into a uh, discussion of those kind of big, big ideas and big, big questions. Um, what MIS does is it establishes a standard um, and our research regularly updates this standard. Um, uh, you've heard some of the ways uh, in which we do that this morning. Abby's talked about the work we're, we're doing uh, in the coming year. Uh, and this is, you know, this is regularly repeated. What that means is that we, uh, we reflect on and we capture those changes in society. But this regular updating of the research also enables us um, to undertake regular analysis of, for example, who meets this standard um, or how far towards meeting this standard households in a range of different sorts of circumstances get. All of this is fundamentally important um, and a big reason why we do MIS and why we continue to do the research that we do. Um, addressing these big questions, and I've seen some of those have come up in the, in the Q&A so far, um, is really important. And Patrick touched on some of this as well. These big questions about the sort of social security system that, that we need, um, that we want as a society, those kind of big policy questions, the role of work uh, in enabling people to have uh, this, this dignified living standard uh, to meet uh, their minimum needs. All of those questions are critical. All of that discussion and debate is really, really important. And uh, our hope is that MIS will very much continue to be used in these ways uh, as we go forward. Um, but, um, and it's an important but, as well as kind of informing and, and encouraging discussion, um, MIS is being used in, in a range, uh, and, and all, you know, an ever expanding almost range of ways by all sorts of different organizations. Um, to shape and influence practice on the ground. So as well as enabling us to kind of think about these bigger questions, um, it's being used practically um, in some really interesting and unanticipated ways. When we started this back in 2008, we hoped it would be useful. Um, and I think actually what, what the organisations we work with these days um, have shown us is that um, people's imagination extends far beyond kind of our, our, our views of the ways in which MIS could be used. Um, and we're going to hear about some of them in a minute. Um, and those organisations are using MIS in practical ways to help households uh, on low incomes to support some of the most vulnerable uh, in, in, in our society. Um, we've heard mention of the real living wage so far uh, a few times this morning, but it's worth reiterating here uh, that more than 8,000 employers, I think it's 8,121 I checked this morning, um, are paying this voluntary higher wage. And this reflects a kind of continuing commitment and a desire to use this evidence from MIS to do the right thing um, for organisations and employers to pay a decent wage. The Scottish Government uh, is using MIS in their measurement of fuel poverty. And um, we've just finished some work. That's the Royal We, it's more Abbey, very much more Abbey than, than I, um, uh, looking at the extra costs in remote rural areas uh, of Scotland as part of this, and, and that will be published soon. Um, we're often approached by people involved with the law or in legal cases um, to see if MIS can be used to test whether households can afford to pay for things. And I think we're going to hear about some of that uh, this morning. We've had lots of contact with housing providers about the affordability of rents um, and how that interplays with other uh, essential costs. 
Um, it's rare, in fact, for a couple of weeks to go by without an email or two about MIS or about MIS data and how these can helpfully inform practice. A good deal of our time is spent talking to organizations. And as I said, often, you know, unanticipated and coming from interesting places uh, to support them in applying MIS in these, in these ways. Um, we're going to hear about some ways in which MIS is being used. Um, but what we wanted to emphasize this morning is that we, uh, uh, we are very much here to support um, this wide range of applications. Um, and I'm very, very keen to hear from uh, anyone here this morning who uh, thinks that MIS may well be a useful tool uh, in their practice. Um, so uh, that's enough from me, frankly. Um, over to uh, Adele, who's going to introduce our next speakers. Thanks, Matt. Um, so I'd like to ask uh, Maggie Sanderson to share her experiences of using MIS with us. Maggie has been Chief Executive of Shetland Islands Council since February 2018. She started her career in local government as an environmental health officer in 1995. Um, and she moved to Shetland's Islands Council to manage environmental health in 2004 and in 2013 she became Director of Infrastructure. Over to you Maggie. Thank you Adele. We first became aware of MIS about 10 years ago and hugely important in helping Shetland understand the issues faced by our most vulnerable households. Understanding means that we can support them better. It, it's important to sh that I share our context. Shetland is a prosperous community with higher than average median wage and relatively low levels of poverty and dep deprivation. That's the picture pre-pandemic and we're still trying to understand what the impacts of the pandemic and Brexit have been on our community. But MIS has enabled us to see our community through the lens of cost of living rather than through the lens of poverty and deprivation. This has shown us that the numbers of struggling households is a lot higher than the standard national data sources were telling us. In 2013, through Highlands and Island Enterprise, the Remote Rural Scotland MIS was commissioned and Shetland Islands Council was an active partner and a funder of that project. It enabled us to compare the cost of living in Shetland and different parts of Shetland with the UK average and see how much higher it is. So for example, the cost of an acceptable standard of living in Shetland is between 20 and 60% higher than the UK average. Costs in Lerwick, our main town, are generally less than in our more remote communities. People in Shetland need to earn more to reach a minimum acceptable standard of living than the UK average. And people in our more remote communities need to earn more than those in the central areas have to have that equal standard of living and benefits do not go as far in Shetland. So how do we use MIS? We've worked with the MIS team and others to use the MIS information alongside other data to understand the impacts of living in a high cost economy. We now know that 49% of households in Shetland don't earn enough to live well. This has flipped our thinking and therefore our policy and practice from one where we thought we were doing okay with low levels of poverty to knowing we have a lot to do to improve outcomes for many of our households. There are a number of, of examples where we've directly and quite practically applied the MIS. During the pandemic, the Scottish Government provided funding to councils for food provision for families eligible for free school meals. In Shetland, we decided to use additional funding to uplift the daily school dinner rate by 20% reflecting the MIS data, making direct cash payments to households from the first lockdown. Our local housing association amended its rent policy so that more remote areas of Shetland pay lower rents than the more central areas, again to accommodate the higher costs of living in our more remote areas shown to us by MIS. The council amended the travel policy for our health and social care workers from a requirement where they would use their own cars to the provision of pool cars 
in recognition of our high cost of living. The council approved a food growing strategy and is actively supporting communities to find land to, to grow food with a particular emphasis on ensuring low income households have access to food in order to keep their household costs down. Having a solid evidence base that is easily accessible to people and articulates so well the costs we face have assisted our politicians in conversations with Scottish Government and we believe the government now has a better understanding of the issues facing Shetland and other remote areas of Scotland. I'm really pleased um, that they're now now commissioning the Scottish MIS to support more of their work, including the fuel poverty strategy and the National Islands Plan. The breakdown of costs for different households is also useful. For example, the cost for, uh, for pensioner households is higher in Shetland compared to the UK, but relatively speaking, it's our working age households that are struggling the most. This data has been useful to counteract some requests for pensioners to get concessions for access to services over and above working age families, helping us to better target our interventions. MIS has been an important evidence base in our discussions with the Scottish Government about lifting COVID restrictions. What's so useful for us about MIS is that the researchers speak to real people the scope is broader than material items alone, incorporating other aspects of people's lives. It's capable of picking up the nuances of life in Shetland, for example, the necessity for tumble dryers for our damp climate and the need for larger fridges for less regular shopping because our boats can stop for days on end. It's capable of comparison between remote rural Scotland and the UK and of picking up differences within our own community. So finally, looking to the future, we need to do more to promote the community wealth building and fair work agenda in order to increase the income that households earn. We'll continue to use the MIS to start conversations with communities around what we can all do to support our more vulnerable communities. Our outwardly wealthy community means that households that are struggling tend to keep it hidden and there's a stigma attached to talking about poverty. But we all share the challenges of living with high costs. So it's something we can all talk about, accept, and we can support each other. The MIS data is talked about in our communities. It's discussed on our Facebook feeds and is leading to people to set up practical support for each other, such as clothes swaps and car shares. So I think this is a start and we have much more to do with the updates that we're getting on MIS. So thanks, Adele. Thank you, Maggie. That was really great. Next, we'll, we will hear from Donald Watkin. Donald is the Chief Executive at the Association of Charitable Organisations, or ACO, the UK umbrella body representing benevolent funds and grant-making charities that provide financial and well-being support to individuals in need. Donald began his career with not-for-profit organisations in Northern Ireland and the US before moving to the UK membership sector. There, he has worked with organisations ranging from the CBI to global professional services uh, networks, developing and supporting their growth and encouraging greater collaboration. Over to you, Donald. Thanks, Adele, for the introduction. And uh, please bear with me for a second while I try and share my screen. Just try and uh, bear with me a second while I just try and bring the main screen on. I'm just trying to share the slide view, which uh, doesn't quite want to play ball at the moment. So if you bear with me, um, I know I shall just use the, the view at the moment if that's okay. Right, thank you. So good morning, everyone. Um, I'd firstly like to congratulate the team on the launch of the latest MIS. And, and certainly, um, before we start, I'd certainly like to flag that we support the report's call to oppose the £20 reduction in universal credit. And also in line with this, we are also fully supportive of the JRF Keep the Lifeline campaign. 
Over the course of the next few minutes, I'd like to give a brief example of the practical application of MIRS in the context of the activity of benevolent charities in the UK. So just to give you a brief perspective of um, benevolent charities and grant making charities and their function at the moment. So um, as I mentioned, we represent or act as the umbrella body for benevolent uh, funds and grant making charities. And in many ways, um, our segment of the sector flies under the radar in terms of general recognition. But whilst the origins of benevolent funds lie in the wave of 19th century um, philanthropy, today's charities provide a range of progressive, sophisticated resources to tackle financial need, and amongst which MIRS often plays an integral role. Um, this support can take various forms, ranging from financial support in terms of one-off or regular payments to beneficiaries, uh, the purchase of white goods, um, equipment adaptations, through to well-being support through mental health, counselling, um, and healthcare provision. And even prior to the pandemic, we saw significant levels of financial assistance rise dramatically. Um, an estimated £216 million pounds was dispersed in 2019, and we received around 500,000 applications for assistance. These ACO members represent a broad church of organisations, and I want to use that in the context of how uh, MIRS is, is, uh, finds a, or provides a practical platform for grant assessments. Um, these charities can include occupational charities, ranging from manufacturing, retail and healthcare, through to the arts, the public sector and hospitality. Uh, we have charities committed to broader um, poverty relief, uh, charities specifically targeting beneficiary groups such as children and young people, older people, women and individuals with physical and mental challenges, uh, as well as armed force and veteran charities and regional charities. So the application for MIS is, is provided um, and useful in terms of a platform across a broad range of uh, benevolent and grant making charities. So the challenge for grant makers is significant. Um, we have to balance demand against resources uh, and prioritise and support. And that's where, frankly, MIS plays a, a significant role in the grant making process, enabling charities to make progressive, equitable and sophisticated assessments based on a clear vision of what should be an acceptable minimum standard of living. Clearly, the pandemic has exacerbated the financial challenges these charities face, where they have to balance increased demand against limited resources. Again, the application of MIRS has enabled these organisations to prioritise the disbursement of funds and often make strategic decisions uh, in difficult circumstances, such as the introduction of emergency relief funds or alternative funding streams for those individuals uh, that come above a typical MIRS baseline assessment. In practice within ACO, we see MIRS in place across a broad range of organisations, as I flagged earlier. Adaptations and customisations are often necessary to reflect the contextual conditions of the relevant beneficiary audience or occupational group. And I know from experience that Professor, uh, Professor Hurst and his colleagues have certainly worked with several charities in developing these adaptations. But at the core, MIS provides an integral baseline which guides the disbursement of vital financial and wellbeing support. Benevolent and grant making charities can make a real impact on the lives of the beneficiaries they support. But it's important that this support is delivered based on a model that provides a systematic, consistent assessment of circumstances that enables financial resources to be delivered efficiently. That is why MIRS provides such an invaluable tool for identifying what an acceptable living standard should resemble and how this model can be applied across the diverse range of income circumstances that we encounter as benevolent charities. So in summary, once again, we congratulate the report authors in January on the launch of the latest standard, and we look forward to this continuing to play an important role in the activity of benevolent charities moving forward. So thank you, everyone. And now I'd like to hand back to Adele.
Thank you very much, Donald. Finally, we will hear from Nimrod ben Kanan. Nimrod is Head of Policy and Profile at the Law Centres Network. This is a membership body for law centres, which are not-for-profit not legal practices providing free advice on civil law to disadvantaged people. Nimrod provides strategic leadership on policy, research and public affairs, and also on raising a law centre's public profile. Over to you, Nimrod. Thank you very much, Adele. Um, I, uh, well, speaking last in this uh, round, I would like to add a few things to consider about the minimum income standards application in the field of justice. Put simply, uh, MIS allows us to gauge the affordability of justice and therefore to quantify the extent of access to justice, which is a common law right. Now, many, and politicians in particular, like to pay lip service to the importance of access to justice for all and the rule of law in the UK. Those least able to pay for legal assistance can, in theory, get legal aid, which is means-tested assistance that, in civil law, helps with problems integral to poverty and disadvantage, problems in housing, social security, discrimination, access to social care, and so on. Uh, these areas of practice, commonly called social welfare law, are those that law centers, whom I represent, have specialized in for over 50 years. However, in 2013, the coalition government has made drastic cuts to civil legal aid in England and Wales, all the while continuing to pay lip service to access to justice. The cuts severely limited the scope of help uh, and eligibility thresholds and increased the rates of the statutory charge, which is legal aid's excess payment. The cuts were so brutal that they far exceeded that government's expectations. Last year's caseload saw half a million fewer new cases than in the year before the cuts being about a third of its former self. Still, these figures do not in themselves demonstrate the human costs of the cuts and their disproportionate effect on the population. That is where MIS comes in. In a 2018 report uh, titled Priced Out of Justice, Professor Donald Hirsch with the, uh, worked with the Law Society of England and Wales to show how many people living in poverty, the target beneficiaries of legal aid, are still priced out of it. They are either not eligible for legal aid or they're priced out by the statutory charge rate they have to pay to access it, or yet, if they prioritize paying the charge, it pushes them deeper into hardship. Um, I think the impact of Donald's work here is likely to have contributed to the government's decision to um, review the legal aid means test uh, decision made the following year, and the results of which should be uh, published uh, this autumn. Now, a year ago, Donald took this step, did this a step further, uh, using MIS to calculate uh, what we call the justice gap. Uh, between being able, uh, being eligible for legal aid on the one hand, and being able to afford average legal fees out of one's own income on the other hand. In uh, the Law Center's network report, Make Law for All, he shows how some, of, uh, some are worse affected than others. Uh, single adults struggle more than couples, uh, and all struggle more uh, the more children they have and the older those children are. In all, over half of people at work, 56%, fall into this justice gap, meaning that they must choose between sacrificing a life essential and living with injustice. This too is an access to justice problem, not just for people living in poverty, but this time for the squeezed middle. Now, the minimum income standard is also being picked up in litigation. This, this was uh, uh, referenced uh, twice uh, before 
in this event. Again, as a way of quantifying the access to justice through its affordability. Not long after the legal aid cuts, the same government significantly increased the fees required at the employment tribunal when making a claim or attending a hearing. Expectedly, new employee claims against bosses for matters like unfair dismissal or discrimination dropped precipitously by 70%. The union unison took up the workers' cause and fought it all the way to the Supreme Court using MIS, among other things, to argue that unaffordable fees really were obstructing working people's access to justice. In July 2017, just under four years ago, uh, the Supreme Court agreed with Unison and ruled the fee hike unlawful, requiring the government to refund those who had paid the higher fees in the preceding four years. Lord Reed, now the president of the Supreme Court, wrote then, and I quote, fees must therefore be affordable, not in a theoretical sense, but in the sense that they can reasonably be afforded. Where households on low to middle incomes can only afford fees by sacrificing the ordinary and reasonable expenditure required to maintain what would generally be regarded as an acceptable standard of living, the fees cannot be regarded as affordable. Now, um, this is clearly a very powerful endorsement of the validity of MIS and of affordability as a practical test for access to justice. I will just end by saying that uh, most recently, MIS is also being used in another Supreme Court case about the uh, whopping fees that the Home Office charges for registering children as British citizens. Uh, the Home Office charges over 1,000 pounds for an application that costs less than 400 pounds to process. Uh, with evidence that the fee is unaffordable for a significant number of child applicants and their families, the charity taking this uh, challenge, PRCBC, has used the Unison affordability test to argue against this. Um, now, while judgment in this case, which was only heard last month, is still forthcoming, we can expect Unison and the logic of the minimum income standard to continue to apply in case law for some time to come. Thank you, and back to you, Adele. Thank you very much, Nimrod. Um, well, I hope you all agree that that's been a really interesting overview of the findings of this year's research, as well as a really fascinating insight into how different kinds of organisations have applied MIS in their work. Um, for the last 15 minutes, I'd like to move us on to some questions um, for the panel. Um, and I'll start with this first one. I think, Abby, I'll come to you first. Um, and if anybody else uh, would like to contribute afterwards, please uh, do let me know. Um, it's from Mariana Becerra, hope I pronounce your name correctly, from Mexico. Uh, regarding on the effects of COVID on what people think is needed, when you asked the nine groups in the UK what changes uh, had happened, I wondered if they mentioned the need for more food in the household. In Mexico, the pandemic has had an impact um, on uh, obesity due to anxiety, especially in kids and adolescents, and that might have changed the needs of more food, especially comfort food. And of course, not being able to leave the house and eat all the meals and having to eat all the meals at home. Thanks Adele and thanks Mariana. Um, lovely to know that you're here um, and a big hello to you and our colleagues in Mexico. Um, yes, really interesting questions around food. We've done quite a lot of groups throughout the pandemic uh, for various projects, some in London, um, the most recent ones for this. And the story about food has changed over time. So as things had sort of settled into something resembling closer to what we might think of as normality, those conversations were more about um, how people had discovered kind of cooking as a as an activity that was something perhaps for the whole family and, and got more involved in it um, they'd had to think more carefully about how they use their resources there was a lot of stuff in the earlier groups that we did quite a long time ago 
um, about people comfort eating and, you know, uh, the whole kind of banana bread baking um, thing that people go into or um, baking lots of treats and sort of sweet things. Um, but it did seem to have sort of settled. There was a lot more about supply and demand, especially in the earlier stages. One of the things that did come out about food was that groups felt, whereas previously the, um, the only households where groups had said you should be able to um, have your uh, groceries, you should be able to order them online and have them delivered, was the working age couple because um, people said for a household of two people you wouldn't be able to make the most of um, you know sort of buy one get one free or discount offers if you were trying to carry it all home on the bus and at that point delivery costs if you went for a midweek slot which is what they went for and so on and so forth it's like a really small amount of money um, it was like 6.99 uh, a month if that I think it there might have even been a quarter um, but now people were very aware that those uh, the the demand for those services had really expanded, um, and supply has now met demand in terms of the supermarkets. There was less sort of uh, empty shelves or making an order and only getting thirty percent of it or whatever. But they said that if people had become accustomed to that, they should be able to continue doing that, even though the costs of having that service were now higher, um, as much as anything, because. They wanted to preserve people's ability to choose if they didn't feel safe to go to the supermarket to continue to have their groceries delivered. Um, and that was an interesting thing that we saw. Again, it, too early to say in terms of the amount of, of food people are having at home. I know that the Mexican MIS budgets, I think in terms of eating out as a family, were potentially quite different. Ours are, it's four times a year, it's a special occasion, and people didn't feel that had changed. Um, the effects of some people reporting more takeaways and more deliveries, um, but that was more their experience rather than what they, how they felt MIS should change per se. So again, it's not really an answer, but we have seen food shifting. We know that food prices are changing. How much of that is COVID? How much of it is Brexit? I don't know, but we will see how that pl plays out. And it will be really interesting to see in the 2022 research, whether the content of the baskets changes um, particularly, um, or whether it's more the prices. And we'll pick that up and report on it next year. Thanks, Abigail. Um, Unless the panel, and does anybody else want to come in on that point or should I move on to the next question? Next question. Um, now we have a question from David Firth. Um, he said, Patrick says internet access is essential in 2021. I agree. However, data poverty seems to be a rising specter in relation to digital inclusion rather than online access. Perhaps data poverty is implicit in online access, but how has that been factored into the MIS research? Um, Matt, I'll come to you first on that, if that's okay. Uh, that's absolutely fine. Um, <laughs> although I may uh, avoid answering it. No, I won't. <laughs> um, uh, it's a really, really critical question, I think. Um, and um, as as was noted in, in the kind of reply, um, we're about to. Um, I say it's a it's a fairly um uh, um. It's not a very clever answer to say that more research is needed, is it? But um, I think this is certainly an area in which more research is needed. And we are about to start some research looking at something, looking at kind of minimum digital living standards. And, and the critical question there is not just about access. Um, it's about uh, knowing how to use these things as well, but also about, um, you know, the availability of data um, and access to, you know, um, speeds uh, across the country. Um, and there are certainly massive inequalities when it comes to that sort of thing. So um, it's not a very clever answer to say that more research is needed, but um, I think you identify a very important, a very important point. In the discussions within, within MIS, um, that detail um, is, uh, uh, group specify um, kind of accessing uh, the internet via broadband, um, but we do not get into conversations necessarily about speed um, or or you know other ways of accessing uh, the the internet within the home. Uh, so yeah, there's there's lots more uh, questions there that I think are really important ones to answer. Thanks, Matt and Maggie. I assume that in Shetland, this is. Um, uh, an issue as well. 
there anything you want to share with us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, across the community, we have different uh, capacity to access. So the broadband speed, the availability of broadband, particularly for some of our remote islands. Um, certainly during the pandemic, um, we've had access to equipment to provide um, access for, for children and disadvantaged families. Um, and individuals to be able to get them onto the internet. And we have had to think about how we provide them with data as well, because it's not just the equipment. And uh, I suppose, you know, uh, digital exclusion is such an area of concern for us. Um, and, and I'm not convinced that some of the broadband rollout will fix that for us and we need to do more. Thank you very much. And we know from our own work at JRF uh, with, um, experts by, through lived experience that uh, digital exclusion is an issue, um, that there's various campaigns um, around because, you know, we know, for example, access to apply for universal credit in most recent times, if it, online access, without online access, it was um, really very difficult, if not impossible. Um, okay, we have a question now from Mona Churgle. How much does society bias impact on what those consulted um, think should be included in, in the MIS budgets? For example, does party political narrative on what is a luxury item impact on what people see as essential? Um, Abigail, I think this is one for you again. Um, it's a really good question. Very interesting. Um, I think the thing is that what we're asking people to do is think about anyone in society and what would be needed by them to feel that they are part of normal society. So that's why, as Patrick mentioned, the, the size of the TV went from uh, 28, uh, 26 inch to 32 um, in 2014. It's stayed that size ever since. So we haven't seen as TVs have become bigger and bigger and the affordability of those bigger, the prices have come down. But what we haven't seen is people saying, oh, because that's so prevalent and available, actually it should be a 50 inch TV. It's still 32 inches. So I think the, the kind of, there is a narrative um, around this where people who haven't necessarily engaged with it in depth suspect that it's just people kind of going oh well everybody should be able to have whatever they like or everybody I know has got a, a 55 inch tv so they should have one too or it's really not like that everything they go through is thought about very carefully and discussed um we've had conversations about do you need a tv a lot of people single working age people might just use a laptop but when we think about the social interaction and social participation being able to watch something on TV with a friend or with more than one friend, you don't all want to be huddled around a laptop. So they have still got a 32 inch TV. So that's just a, a very small example of the kinds of things where politicians might think that this is all about people being sort of grabby and wanting um, Sky or whatever. And no group has ever included any kind of cable or um, satellite viewing service as a, a minimum. Um, the groups think about this very carefully. Interesting, what has come in from public policy is things like we saw quite early on uh, people's mention of five a day. So when we were talking about the, the food baskets, everybody was kind of talking about, oh, well, when you're having your main meal, you need that and two or three vegetables and, you know, there'd be some salad in your sandwich and because you've got to have your five a day. So that was clearly a message that they had sort of internalised and were were sort of bringing to bear on it. So there are some kind of political messages or, or policy um, sort of messages that are coming back to us from groups. So another example of this is childcare where um, a big emphasis on early years education um, has happened during the lifetime of MIS. When we started in 2008, the uh, childcare that people described was um, usually a childminder. Um, and then as we developed over time, 2012, people were saying, oh, early years education is really important. They need that socialising, that, that getting them used to a more formal environment. You should be able to choose the nursery. 
um, and that should be the kind of default setting. If you choose to use a childminder because that's right for you, that's fine. But generally those were not seen as as expensive as a nursery and, and the nursery was the sort of default. So those sort of policy shifts, people were becoming aware of expectations around early years and those importance of that foundation. Similarly, um, the um, emphasis on uh, sort of activities for children, the parents reported they increased the budgets back in, I think it was 2016, um, for children's activities because they said there are so many of them on offer and you want your kid to be able to take part and find out what they're good at and what they enjoy and you want to encourage them to be active um, and be able to support that. Uh, so those are kinds of real world um, sort of effects of policy. Um, that we've seen coming out in conversations. Adele, you're on mute. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Apologies. Um, um, we've got one more question here. Um, what gender analysis has been adopted as part of Ms. Modelling? For example, have women's specific experiences of the labour market, including working hours and earnings and women's unpaid caring responsibilities been incorporated into Ms. Policymaking? Um, don't know whether um, Matt or um, Abby, who wants to field that one? Um, I'll have a go. Um, uh, I think uh, certainly in terms of, and there's two kind of separate things here, I think. One is uh, about what's incorporated into the basket because of, you know, as a consequence of discussions that go on uh, amongst the public. Um, and the other is kind of how we use that, those data in, in analysis and then looking at, um, you know, the actual incomes of people and how they, how they fare relative to, to MIS. Um, I think it's an issue where we, you know, it's a question, a really important question, an issue where we could do more um, in terms of the analysis that we do on a kind of regular basis to look at this. Um, we do look at um, uh, pensioners uh, and gender uh, and the impact of uh, gender on kind of pensioner incomes in more detail in our annual Households Below MIS um, report. Um, uh, and the reason we've looked at that uh, in relation to kind of people who are retired is because there's such a such a massive gap between um uh, genders uh, in retirement um uh, i don't know if abby's got anything to say about you know how we kind of talk about these things in groups but certainly from an anal analytical point of view um i think there is more again this is just me saying there's more we could do um this is not my question not my answer to every question but um you know uh, yes there there is definitely more that we could do in in terms of looking at gender thanks Abby, anything uh, to add? Um, I guess that in within groups, because we are not specifying people's working status, because the idea is that it should be a need for anyone in our society. It's not about um, deserving and undeserving poor or um, if you're working, you should be able to have this. And if you're not, you shouldn't. The idea is that especially with um, the nature of employment being so um, sort of fragile and can shift so easily because just because you've you're um employed today uh, and then not employed tomorrow on a zero hours contract or because you've made redundant or you your firm has folded or whatever it is um it doesn't mean you suddenly stop needing a sofa or suddenly stop needing a tv or suddenly stop needing to be able to interact with your friends or family so the kind of um standard is based upon the assumption that um everybody has these needs um, and if you're not in work you need the ability to be in work so you still need the clothes that you would need to be able to go to interview in or if you got the job that you would be able to turn up every day looking presentable um, so in that respect the groups themselves the conversations we have aren't based on um, that idea about kind of oh well if if you're in a particular set of circumstances do you or don't you need this um, and the other, but the other thing to say is that we do have single gender groups to make sure that we are listening to and hearing from women, uh, you know, groups of women and groups of men separately um, to make sure that we are picking up any kind of nuances in, in differences in terms of need. Thank you so much. Um, 
that's actually um, all the time we have this morning. Thank you to everybody on the panel and thank you to everybody who's joined, been able to join us live, but also anybody who's watching this um, after today. Um, as I mentioned at the start, we will be sending around the recording of the webinar soon. And if there are any questions we haven't been able to get to, we will pick them up outside of the session. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, and goodbye. <laughs>